who is the next Miyazaki? Hmm. Because, of course, that is a question you can answer. Uh, easily. <laughs> easily. Power over. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, clearly, it is whoever directs One Piece. Um, that, is, that is the thing. Um, nothing against One Piece, obviously. So we want to do this panel partly because it's a kind of a, a clickbait title, um, but also because it is actually an interesting question, I think, to actually uh, think about, because Miyazaki does sit in this interesting place in anime as being kind of the ambassador for normies into anime. Uh, yes. where a lot of folks are into anime through Miyazaki, and a lot of folks are like, you know, I'm not sure if my spouse would like anime, but they'll probably like a Miyazaki movie. Um, there's also, Miyazaki is also kind of a an auteur in terms of he doesn't do something like normal anime. So that is also a thing to kind of think about. Um, like, does it fit that thing of <laughs> what... Um, of anime that's not like a typical you know, shonen anime, for, for example. So who are some of those creators who kind of might hit that, that, um, that thing, right? Oh, it's a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, exactly. Who's the next Chuck Jones in animation? Yeah, like, there's right, no, right. no exact person, but are there folks who kind of fit that thing? Um, so what would be some of the names you guys would, would put on that list? I mean, <laughs> The, the, the person who, like, inspired the entire panel idea for the last decade has been Shinkai. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Shinkai. Um, that would definitely be kind of one of the big ones. Um, I'd put Mamoru Hosoda on the list as well. Um, certainly for being kind of family films, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I know Satoshi Kon was on the list for sort of a, a adult anime for a long time, but he's not making any anime anymore, sadly. So. Yeah, sad. Um, you, you know who would be... No, I know who should take over, mm. Ghibli. Mm -hmm. Oshi. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> he, such such approachable... <laughs> approachable, easily works. to understand. Exactly. Um, <laughs> what about Ghibli itself? Like, obviously, Ghibli's <clears throat> kind of dismantling, right? Right. But if they were to continue, and you know, assuming that, like, Goro took over, whether he directs or not, right. like, is there some possibility there? Um, so we could kind of say Ghibli itself. Didn't Goro, like, go off? Wait, did, who was Earwig in the Witch? That wasn't Ghibli, right? That was a Studio Panok, I think. Um, or maybe, um, but yes, uh, Earwig. Did Goro direct that? Um, okay, the Earwig in the Witch is Ghibli. It is uh, Goro um, directing. Okay. Um, uh, that is Ghibli. But there was, was it Studio Panok? Um, they were founded by ex-Ghibli guys. Um, they're the ones that did, yeah, Mary and the Witch's Flower. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah form, former lead film producer at Studio Ghibli, and I think a bunch of their other um, staff. So we could say kind of Studio Pinocchio in general. Uh, they're definitely trying to do that kind of list, um, or that, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I guess there's a question of uh, what, I, what I considered yesterday when I remembered how long Miyazaki's been in it. Is yeah. He's... He's been doing this since the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, now it's, I think the more relevant part of that is when did he become a household name, True. especially in, or like, quote unquote household name yeah. uh, in the U.S. And I would, I, I mean, definitely by 2001 with Spirit of the Way, he mm -hmm. was nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah. Right. Uh, but even before then, he had been pretty notable. Um, so I guess a way to look at it too is. Uh, really new, really fresh directors uh, that have been mm. uh, knocking it out of the park lately. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's names like the. I think it's also appropriate to talk about people like Oshi and uh, Hosoda because al although they've been in it for a while, compared to Miyazaki's runtime, they're relatively new. Right. Yeah, like true. Shinkai has been in the game for two decades at this point, mm. but he's still only. 51 years old yeah. right. compared to Miyazaki's age. Yeah, by, by Miyazaki's standards, he would be making Nausicaa now. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's like and, so early. And I mean, the most direct comparison is that uh, Shinkai has had his breakout movie. True. He had, yeah. Technically, he's had several breakout movies, yeah. but Your Name was the one that really yeah. uh, skyrocketed him. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I, to your point, I think that it has to be lightning in a bottle again. So you'd yeah, have to true. have these people like Shinkai right. and, yeah. and, and, and Goro and, and people coming coming together, not just because mm-hmm. of you know who they are, but what each person brings to the table. Because like, I'm thinking of like, when we think of Ghibli, we, we think of fantastical backgrounds, and Shinkai is just a master of just mm-hmm. making these beautiful things mm-hmm. in the background and, and stuff like that. So it might be just like all these different people coming together and just going, oh, hey, we can do the thing. And and then making a studio out of it. And, yeah. you know. the, the the further question is too is the, like what Brent mentioned at the beginning of a uh, uh, Miyazaki bringing it to uh, to the point where you don't even watch an anime; it's a Miyazaki film. It's yeah, not, not I, really. Yeah. Who is able to get to the point where it's like, oh, you're not watching an anime film; you're watching a, a, a Shinkai film or mm-hmm. Osoda film. It's, none of them have quite reached that same plateau yet. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, the I think the argument is between the old guard and the new guard of like sure. uh, Miyazaki is getting up there in age, but even people, it, he, uh, even people that have been around him since like the eighties, like they still have a pretty good future too. Yeah, like Anno still has a future. Mm. Uh, we don't know if he's going to be doing anything anime related, <laughs> but he's doing stuff. He's doing plenty of live action stuff. Yeah, um, and it's the, the 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 pros and cons is that. With the older artists or the older directors, it's much easier to have a point of reference for what they've already done and True. where they can stake mm-hmm. their claim mm-hmm. uh, versus the fact that uh, some of them may not be as prolific as they once were. Some of them may not be doing anime anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the newer ones, you see how strong they are out of the gate, but it's you have no frame of reference for how strong they're going to be going forward. Yeah, uh, Like, yeah. I think... The one I wanted to talk about specifically, who's had a pretty big splash lately, is the guy who directed Bochi the Rock and Free Run. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Keichiro Saito. Uh, and he was doing uh, episode directing and, you know, key animation. And I think Bochi, well, I don't think, Bo- I don't believe Bochi was his first directorial okay. i think it was his first major directorial <coughs> okay. debut um and those two have been pretty widely received mm-hmm. and this was actually a question i was asking myself like a week ago as to like who are the new names true uh, yeah. there have been plenty of names <coughs> i'm familiar with in, in the early early to mid 2010s and mm-hmm. like late 2009 uh you do have uh, Naoko Yamada, you have yeah. Rei Matsumoto, you have um, uh, uh, Marie Okada, mm-hmm. you have Watanabe still. Watanabe is still making mm-hmm. stuff, but yeah. when you get to people like Watanabe and Ikuhara, uh, they've mm-hmm. been around since the 90s, and they, they're like probably a generation after Miyazaki mm-hmm. and some of those other creators. Yeah. But they haven't been as prolific. Like, Watanabe and Ikuhara make one thing every like five to seven years. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like Otomo, right? Yeah, Where it's right. like he's done a handful of stuff, but he's not, you know, consistently. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a question of like who can reach Miyazaki's height because there have been you've had in the same time frame as Miyazaki, you had Junichi Sato and you had Osamu Dazaki. Yeah, and those two were like grandmasters in their own mm-hmm. right. And but the problem is is like they're not on the same level as Miyazaki. Yeah. I think you also had the, the, the situation of the consumability, where I think movies were a lot easier to distribute back in yeah. the 80s, 90s, for example, compared to a TV series. So it was easier for Miyazaki's stuff to spread than for Rose of Versailles to spread. Right. Right. Um, even in, like, a fan sub situation. So I think Miyazaki had that benefit over a lot of his peers. Right. And... Uh, uh, I think the, the 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 trick here, the trick to the question, who's the next Miyazaki? Is whoever mm. becomes the next Miyazaki is going to become such a household name themselves that mm. you know they right. won't be compared to Miyazaki anymore. They'll mm. they'll have created their own path. Yeah. And and all joking aside, to that point, you know, getting to that point, um, the one who gets who does these movies and gets the McDonald's endorsement, right? Like, like being serious, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. getting those kinds of endorsements yeah. here in America. That's what you kind of know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it also gets gets up to the the situation of like 
um, Miyazaki films also don't follow anime tropes enough to feel distinctive. So like, um, uh, I want to bring up Naoko Yamada specifically because A Silent Voice, as amazing a film it is, feels very anime, yeah. right? It, it, is, it is very close to all of the tropes and, and, and styles of a TV series. Um, so it doesn't stand alone the way Castle in the Sky stands alone, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, its, own, its own aspect. I think the other complexity is that um, when Miyazaki was coming up, there was more elbow room in the industry to tell different stories, original stories, to be a little bit more one-off, whereas now we're in a much more, um, what's the, the right term? We're in a, an industry that is very established. Um, you know, here are our genres, here are the genres we execute on, and there are, there are fewer weirder anime than there were in the 80s, for example. That, and you didn't get as, I mean, that, it's not franchisable. I mean, that's one of the mm -hmm. things about Ghibli is that it's not a, it's not really a franchise. True, yeah. And, and all the movies that Miyazaki has done, none of them are franchise. Like, ha, ha, mm -hmm. have we gotten a part two to Nausicaa? No, we haven't. <laughs> right? um, so, you know, uh, you know, when you have <clears throat> other, when you have an industry now that, that places an emphasis on franchises, like I'm looking at Fate Zero and, yeah. and all those guys where it's in JoJo and all them, mm -hmm. where it's just like this massive Thing, yeah. you know because you gotta keep the franchise going Me, meanwhile Miyazaki all he has to do is more or less wake up let the kids <laughs> play with chainsaws as he's coming up with an idea and you know boom there it is he can do yeah. the one thing and he can be done with it and most importantly he can move on to the next thing yeah that's and true he's not worried about what people are going to think about what the next thing is that's actually a really good point that I think Miyazaki's success has as much to do with him creating Studio Ghibli. Yeah. With having a safe space within he can within which he can create his own original works that is funded by a extremely successful business person. Um, so he's not beholden to saying, well, we've got to keep the franchise going. We, you know, Girls and Ponds is a great example where like, much as I love that show, that is very clearly a thing that pays the bills. Yeah. Uh, and they love it and they, they do good stuff with it, but it, it, you know, it, is, it is meant to be something that they can keep on making more Girls and Ponds or stuff with. Um, people are uh, in chat are asking a very interesting question. The next Miyazaki might come from China. Mm. Yeah. And that's a very good point. Um, the Chinese mm. have caught up real quick. Yeah. Um, now the question is, will there be the ability to have that kind of longevity and that kind of originality out of China? All kidding aside, if they ever decide to do Genshin Impact the movie, that's... that's, that's <laughs> Be mm -hmm. Yeah, Billy Billy does good stuff. Like they, they, you know, the the animation. Well, th that gets back to a lot of our, our question too, where it's like, what makes <coughs> Miyazaki special is not even the quality of the animation; it's the approach they take to that animation. It's that yeah. we're going to do this fifteen times until it looks as naturalistic as possible. We're looking for that kind of a skill. Um, you know, there are lots of studios that can do anime <coughs> at a high quality bar. It's the way in which you do that. Uh, yeah, it's a. There's a lot of there's a lot of people. Some people in chat talking about how like how Miyazaki got to the point he's at. Mm. I think it's a, a. The parallel is not for someone to copy Miyazaki's path to mm -hmm. become the same success. It's one of the situations that we're dealing with today, and like what is the environment we're in today where. Yeah. Like who is going to to ride the lightning and like actually end up in the in a. Yeah by using all of today's uh, uh, technologies, globalization, yeah. uh, every, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, how are they going to use that to uh, well, forge their own path and yeah. become that, that same level of uh, yeah. auteur as Miyazaki? Because Miyazaki is not technically innovative. Right, the, the animation right. he does is very much the way animation is done, and he he brings in like computers where where necessary and so forth. But it's not like he's reinventing cinema when he when he's making his films. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree. It's like who can um, who can ride that wave? I thought Makoto Shinkai would be the one. Um, I mean, he's come the closest. Yeah. Uh, 
but yeah. the, the 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 interesting comparison here is that you mentioned Miyazaki's films not feeling like anime. Well, Shang Tai's breakout film was the one that felt most anime. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, Weathering with You and Suzume like took yeah. took cues from mm-hmm. Your Name, but yep. uh, Your Name is like uh, much more anime looking characters, mm-hmm. much more anime uh, tropes yep. uh, in how the characters behaved, uh, much more anime humor, mm-hmm. but some something clicked and everybody was like this yeah. is it like, and, and his most Miyazaki like movie Children Chase Lost Voices nobody saw right <laughs> yeah. like, somebody somebody pointed out in chat that there's been a like you know Miyazaki's like Kubrick and Kubrick had a lot of mm-hmm. imitators uh, yeah and I think we saw Shinkai try to imitate Miyazaki and he failed miserably mm-hmm. at least critically yeah um, I mean I think there is merit in Shinkai exploring new ideas like that. And sure, I would, yeah. I would like to see him do Please another do fantasy world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I would like for him it to be like a holy Shinkai thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's one, one of the things that excited me about Suzume, because yeah. Suzume felt like he was stretching into that fantastical element. Yeah. Um, he was doing something a little weirder. You know, one of the characters is a chair. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it does feel like that. He's, he's starting to build his... And he's got universe. his own. He's got his own studio. Yeah. He's got comic yeah. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he also needs to. Shinkai also needs to find a book to read and say that I'm making this movie off of this book, <laughs> like Boy and the Heron, and have that book be almost nothing like <laughs> Boy and the Heron. It's a good book. It's a good book. Don't 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 get me wrong. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. How I mean, do we live? Yeah. But, um, that, that happened with the uh, Howl's Moving Castle too. Yeah. Mm, it's yeah. Completely, wholly original. <laughs> but it's but it's based yeah. on that. Yeah. How. <laughs> Kiki was a book too, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I mean, and for one of his, I mean, lesser known but still mm. well, well to do projects, Anne of Green Gables. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. how closely it mo- mirrored it. Uh, so that that was a very direct adaptation. Okay. Um, but that was more Takahata. He he was driving okay. that one more than Miyazaki. Yeah. In fact, um, Miyazaki left Anne of Green Gables like a quarter of the way through to do Lupin. Uh, so that's right. Yeah. Uh, and there's also like Nasca comparisons. I don't mm. remember. I don't know Actually, if the no, manga yeah. came out first or not. Uh, manga was first for Nasca. Okay, yeah. and who, well, both. Do we know who had a hand in driving Nasca's story? Uh, Miyazaki. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, the, the, there are notable differences in the manga and the anime. So the, the difference there is that um, he started the manga. Um, so mm, the original idea for Nasca was to make a movie. No one would give him the money to make the movie. So Suzuki said, if you draw a manga, we will publish that in Animage. You can now say there is a manga of it. And so then when you go back to the financiers, they can say, oh, there's a manga. Cool, we will finance it. So he started doing that with the intent to turn into a movie. Then after he made the movie, he was like, there's more legs here. So he expanded the, the, the story dramatically in the manga way beyond what the movie is to the point where the ultimate plot and and themes of the manga are much more subtle and more complex and kind of not quite contradict but are um much more much better fleshed out if you will than the, than the movie is because the movie is only so so long so it's very complicated there right um uh, let's see here i think yeah i think uh, people people are talking about franchise and like the, the other thing to compare to is that I think we have less movie directors to go off of mm. in today's formats as opposed yeah. to TV directors. Mm, true. Uh, there are directors who are branching out into movies, mm-hmm. uh, but a lot of them do end up just returning to like 12 episode or two core, one core stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's not to say that their movies weren't successful. Uh, it's just sometimes it's hard to even get a grasp on what's going on because yeah. like uh, I think Murray Okada's uh, directorial film debut was Machia mm. and like I think that was moderately successful mm-hmm. but I haven't heard anything about Murray Okada doing a new film mm, mm-hmm. um, I mean she did a she did a completely original manga and a TV series yeah. in the last few years uh, but uh, I it's even hard for me to think about movies that are coming out that are anime original. Yeah. Like, well, and it's kind of like what Hasoda said, where he said once he, uh, once he had all of his experiences with Toei and uh, Ghibli 
he was like, I need to found my own studio to do this. You know, I, I can't make this if I'm bouncing from studio to studio, making a film here, a film there. I need kind of that, sa that safe space in which to do this. Um, and I think his studio is more a production company than like a, you know, like I think he actually hires Toei basically to animate it um, or they, they work together. But th there is that aspect that, you know, if you're doing an amazing one-off anime film, it seems to be a single thing. And you go back into the industry and continue doing other stuff. You're not, um, you know, it's a lot harder to do another interesting film. Right. Um, and that's interesting because with a few notable exceptions, uh, the TV series are the ones that, or the movies are the ones that get a lot more global recognition than mm. TV. Like, we have the most famous exception of Demon Slayer today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have things like, things that are getting pushed on Netflix, especially, like Spy yeah. Family is actually becoming more mainstream. Mm, true. Yeah, too. Absolutely right. Uh, and then Attack on Titan, Sword Art Online, uh, the Shonen stuff is still making a breakthrough in Western audiences. Mm -hmm. But nothing is making a breakthrough in global audiences like uh, Miyazaki's stuff yeah. ended up doing. And I guess it's interesting. Besides, like, Shinkai's rare, like, Your Name made a breakthrough, but mm -hmm. I don't think Weathering with You and Susan May made nearly the same impact, no. the same splash. No, definitely not. Um, definitely uh, build up. Um, it's a little bit easier to, to throw a television series <clears throat> onto a streaming platform. True. And getting people involved with it, especially if you, if you have the ability to, to binge it. Building a movie for for um, global audiences is, is hard Yeah. For, for any movie because of the production. And the production yeah. has to purchase, um, you know, film distribution right? mm -hmm. and they have to get it out there and there is you know still some for globally speaking for, unless you, you you know Miyazaki got lucky honestly mm -hmm. and uh, you know so when you say Studio Ghibli all the distributors and all the production houses are going to go oh, yeah, we're going to make the money <laughs> we're going to make the money you put out Suzume a beautiful movie mm -hmm. um, and they're going to be like did she go who mm -hmm. you know literally and they're just going to be like well we don't know this guy yeah. And it's just, and it's kind of hard when you're established in a certain market, mm -hmm. and then trying to convince other people, no, no, this is really good. This guy yeah. is really, really good. Mm -hmm. We need to give him that chance and get him out of here. So it's it's a big, it, it's unfortunately it's about the monies. Well, and and as John's pointing out in chat, we do live in the age of remakes and adaptations, adaptations. and yeah. coming back to things over and over. So there's there's even less of a market. Like you know, if a company has a slate of five things coming out this year, and now three of those are remakes. Yeah. <laughs> There's well, just only so many slots well, for well, original think about stories. All the, uh, not to touch on a, on a sensitive subject too mm -hmm. much, but think of all the superhero movies in the past year that were killed. Yeah. Even, in, even after post-production, they were mm -hmm. killed and just not going to be shown. And, you know, you know, just for the sake of being able to remarket mm -hmm. a, 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 a known quantity and saying oh how are they going to do it this time mm. and instead of just saying we got something new and unusual for you to see mm -hmm. you know thought provoking instead of going being hating on reddit because <laughs> so and so played the role of such and such mm -hmm. so why, why don't we have something mm, there you go mm -hmm. yeah um there's also the point that and the corner scream t is mentioning in, in the chat right just the, kind of the, the 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 growth of a director um it, it should be pointed out, in fairness, like, Nausicaa was not, like, a massive financial windfall for Ghibli. Right. Um, Totoro was not a huge windfall. Like, it took them quite a few years to become a household name in, in Japan and to become, like, a, a, a cash cow, right? Like, they, they were doing yeah. fine. But, um, you know, it, it takes a while to really build up that reputation. So, uh, I think... You know, you look at Naoko Yamada, you know, Naoko Yamada, you look at some of the other folks who've done one or two things, and it's like, maybe they could, they just haven't built up that, that library yet, um, in fairness. Some of it, I think, too, is, like, just the weight of the studio behind it. Yeah. Because, like, like, we know why Miyazaki became so popular in the U.S., and it's not solely because of the quality of his work, it is mostly because of Disney being behind it. Mm. Like, Disney had the entire apparatus to make, mm. like, they could make anything they want into a household <laughs> name. Mm -hmm. um, 
and notwithstanding what they're doing with like their own properties nowadays sure, right. like if they the the most surprising thing is that your name was picked up by um uh, g kids i believe mm, mm-hmm. and that was like kind of a shock to me i was like mm. if, if they if any studio was to or if they were going to select any studio to do a promotion of mm. Uh, your name I thought it would have been something gigantic I thought it would have mm-hmm. been something Disney level yeah but G Kids did it and while G Kids has done a lot of good for their uh, films while they've uh, you know mm-hmm. gotten uh, Oscar nominations here and there um, the problem is that G Kids does not have the same kind of apparatus that Disney does it yeah. does not have the ability to put it in every movie theater uh, that they they want it to be in necessarily mm-hmm. Yeah, and they just, you know, if you if you tell a kid, a parent that, it, uh, especially for uh, movies that are focused on kids, it's like, well, this is a Disney movie. <laughs> to sum it up, this is a Disney movie, right? Like, <laughs> versus this is a G Kids movie. Like, mm-hmm. like who the hell is G Kids? Yeah, um, and you know, you you look at how they they release those things. They they were not, you know, uh, like. As I recall correctly, Mononoke, Princess Mononoke, and Spirit Away, those were both art house releases. Yeah. Like they, they did not release in major um, theaters worldwide, but they were in, uh, uh, countrywide. But they were in like a couple of hundred, you know, art house films all across the U.S. So if you wanted to see it, you could. But they weren't like you know we're going to put eight hundred million dollars behind this, and if not, then then you're 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 you know we're done. So they even they kind of like built his name over time. To the point where he became that household name, um, and then was it Ponyo that got the first like big wide release? I think for for uh, Miyazaki movies. Uh, I don't. Know. Yeah, wide release. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I think Ponyo was the first wide release, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and you got Lightning in a Bottle. Absolutely. Um, you know, Tomino famously talked about that of Gundam being a Lightning in a Bottle, but he just couldn't replicate. Um, things like that happen. But yeah, Miyazaki's an, an interesting case. Like, and I think you, you can also slice it down. I, I like the direction of saying, if we're going to get something that is that has broad international appeal, I'm almost more willing to bet for, on a Chinese director, kind of coming out of nowhere, and like having a studio that says, we are now going to compete on a world stage. We're going to put the money behind it. We're going to you know, intentionally internationalized, like the production, everything else like that. Like a lot of Chinese animation right now is very much made for the Chinese market because there's a billion of them. Right. So they're like, there's no, you know, we don't need to appeal to an international audience. But somebody's going to come along to say, yes, I want that, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it for that. I think the other part of the the Chinese possibly providing in the next Miyazaki is that Chinese folklore, of which Japanese folklore is... takes heavily from um it's massive i mean mm-hmm. there's so many stories there's so many fantastical stories yeah. that could be told um if they if they wanted to yeah um, yeah it's um, a, it is yeah. i mean to that point uh we've already seen the chinese apparatus being thrown at uh, gaming genshin, mm-hmm. uh, genshin yeah. by itself is like you know of course it, it had to catch fire in china before it caught fire anywhere else but mm-hmm. it's like you know they they are making a lot of forays into triple a games now too mm-hmm. and like it's they have enough I, they probably have enough i don't know about the economy specifically behind gaming and media in china mm. that is way beyond my area of expertise but they definitely have enough uh like if anything catches on in there like they can churn it and burn it enough that they can yeah yep it, it can explode like a, a shotgun shell out into the rest of the world mm-hmm. yeah exactly um and they can do it so many times that they can they'll hit the nail on the head eventually yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but we also like we, we are slowly seeing more Korean properties being brought into mainstream anime too mm-hmm. uh, right. solo leveling was just heavily oh, promoted right. by Crunchyroll yeah that's right, that's right. Uh, and while that is I, I would not say that solo leveling will ever be on the level of like a Miyazaki <laughs> like, yeah. we are seeing it being like Crunchyroll is throwing their power behind marketing it and that was a manhwa like right. mm-hmm. the, the characters all have Korean names. Uh, it was com- completely a Korean thing, and it's like, I think, I don't, I would be more interested to hear an expert talk about 
uh, China as to why it seems like they waited so long to try and go for a globalist uh, mm. approach to media, mm-hmm. but it really seems like they are ramping up, uh, yeah. like at least in the, the these few like gaming and animation and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just looking up. Um, um, uh, Neja was a 2019 Chinese animated film um, that made $700 million in 46 days in China alone, right? Like, that's the kind of money they're looking at <laughs> over yeah. there where they do. And that also kind of answers the question, too, to an extent, where, again, it's like, kind of like we're making plenty of money here, so like there, there's, not, there's not a, a huge view um, uh, outside. It was the highest grossing animated film of all time in China. Um, and the fastest animated film ever to reach $400 million, uh, which was in 12 days. Uh, so yeah, like there's, yeah. There, there's definitely the opportunity there. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Jaden. Like there, it, it's, a, it's a very different market where like they don't, uh, well, they don't have to mention names. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of, you know, they don't have the same laws and expectations and, and uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, the studio systems and such. So it's very different. Yeah, it's a, I think it's, it's just a matter, if it was going to be a Japanese director, it's got to be a matter of consistency too. True. Like, you hear, there's, you hear so much, especially about the economics of anime. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the situation... I'm sure the situation was not terribly different in the, the 60s onwards. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. There wasn't ever a lot of money in animation. Right. Uh, but Miyazaki like stuck with it, and it was his whole life for mm-hmm. like six decades. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it still is his life. He's like, we know for a fact that he's yeah. still working. Right. Ghibli has confirmed that he is still working on stuff now. Yeah. Uh, so... Like, you have to have that drive, too, where, you know, uh, again, like, we, we see Shinkai with that kind of drive. Uh, I mean, Hosoda's been pretty semi-consistent, although yeah. his movies have not reached the heights that uh, even his old movies have reached. Sure. Um, but you have directors like Rie Matsumoto, who is, like, beloved by a lot of more hardcore anime fans mm-hmm. for making things like Blood Blockade Battlefront mm. and uh, some of her other previous properties. Like, she's essentially dropped off the face of the earth. Mm. She does. She's like directed two commercials, <laughs> and we, we nobody else knows what she's doing right now. Yeah. Um, and you have someone like Sayo Yamamoto who has uh, done uh, the woman called Fujiko Mine. Mm-hmm. She's done um, Yuri on Ice. But the problem with that is like, well, Yuri on Ice, she could have capitalized on the on the hype for it, mm-hmm. but it's eight years later I think yeah. and we don't yeah. have a season two we don't have a movie that was promised like yeah. uh, when you, you have like Brent's looking up Ikuhara here <laughs> Ikuhara makes one thing every seven or eight every like if decade that. yeah yeah basically and then it doesn't make any money <laughs> yeah like and he, he's he is an expert at what he does but he's not very good at making money mm-hmm. yeah I mean he d- did basically nothing during the decade of 2000s um, right uh, he did Penguin Drum in 2011, uh, Yurikuma Rashi in 2015, Sarazan Mai in 2019, announced new anime in 2020, and we haven't heard about anything more about it yet. So it's like, ugh, it's tough. Uh, and then before that, it was Utna, basically, and then Sailor Moon before that. Yeah, and it's, right. it's some of that's a question of like, well, what the hell are they doing? Like, mm-hmm. how, we know there's not a lot of money in animation, and we know, yeah. Iku, like, specifically, Ikuhara didn't make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So is he like, is he mooshing off of. Like Ano, yeah, yeah. Maybe the secret is just that for Miyazaki is that you have to be a cranky old man, borderline socialist communist <laughs> to make to make these things. I, Maybe I will get the message out. <laughs> I will get it out. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there, there's a lot of um, there is a lot of stuff that I think makes Miyazaki distinctive. Also, the fact that Miyazaki is very driven to making anime that has that family appeal mm-hmm. which a lot of anime is not right Ikuhara <clears throat> is a great example right. where like no one's showing Utna to their eight year old I hope 
um, right? Um, there, there's there's that general appeal to his, to to Miyazaki's works that yeah. I think also helps a lot. Um, which is why I think and that also is one of the reasons why perhaps Shinkai hasn't gotten that big, is because again, are you going to show you know um, how appropriate to young kids is um, your name? Right? Are they going to really yeah. get it? it it's, it's a fairly com- you know complex movie in terms of it, it doesn't you, know, you kind of have to follow what's going on. Young kids are going to get bored with that. Um, not, not that all of Miyazaki's movies are for young kids, right. but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's a it's the rare instance of like a universal appeal of Miyazaki. Like, <laughs> like adults will watch Totoro and get something mm-hmm. out of it. Adult yep. and uh, kids will watch Totoro and get something out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the same with all almost all of Miyazaki's movies. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have the Boy and the Heron is probably one of his more complex films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, compared yeah. to you, you can compare it to Mononoke and Tosca, yeah. where it's like those were more adult leaning, yeah. but you would not totally be opposed to showing a kid something like Nasuka. Sure. Maybe Mononoke, mm-hmm. just strictly based on a PG-13 rating. Mm. Um, but Boy and the Heron is not something that I think a kid would get too much out of. True. Because it deal- unless they dealt with similar things the protagonist yeah. did. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's an interesting yeah. question. The more I think about it, I'm going to have to watch the movie from that lens. Because it is supposedly, I mean, how do you live, is very much a story for kids to say, here's how you should live. But I I agree with you. Like, The Boy and the Heron, structurally, seems like it is a, you know, young boy going on an adventure film. But thematically, and like all the other elements of it, make it not a fun ride for a kid to watch. Yeah. I mean, there are are whimsical characters. There are cute characters, mascot character designs. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, that, yeah. I mean, he's, and that's not Miyazaki coming and uh, adjusting the times. He's always mm. had those cute designs. Oh, yeah. um, but it is, like, you do have to take a step back from that film and think about what he was trying to tell you. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, you know, unfortunately, or slash fortunately, depending on your perspective, he does not hand feed you much of the symbolism, much mm-hmm. of the information. I'm yeah. sure there is a lot of. Uh, heavy Japanese or culturally Japanese aspects of that movie that totally went over my head. Yeah. Um, because there is a lot of stuff that I did not understand on first watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's funny. You were you were you were forced to watch Ghibli in school and hated them. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's fair. I think yeah. especially when it comes to any kind of media, like mm-hmm. uh, there have been books that I have read in school and out of school where the book. Like, I think the best example is Animal Farm. Mm. I never read that in school, but I read that by myself. Like, I was in college, but I wasn't reading it for college. Mm. I was reading it because I wanted to. Yeah. And I found a great enjoyment with Animal Farm that I didn't find with something like 1984. Interesting. Because I was forced to read 1984 and make analysis on it. So, when, when, yeah, when you have to, having worked in theater, when you know the nuts and bolts behind it, the, the story becomes less enjoyable. And then, right. when, and then when you come in into it without having any preconceptions or, or, or knowledge mm. of it, and you go in there and you read it, and like Animal Farm, you, you kind of you discover like a, a really rich, rich, rich story. And even if you don't, as a kid, don't understand some of the symbology that's going on in that story, there's still elements of it that, of your get, that you get that you're just like, oh, Napoleon's a jerk. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and there's a reason why he's a jerk. Mm-hmm. And, you yeah. know, th- th- those, yeah. those kinds of things. And the thing with Miyazaki is that it kind of suffers, on, it occasionally suffers from what I call the Fantasia effect, where Fantasia is not a kid's movie. Mm. But parents bring their little rugrats <laughs> there all the time to, to watch this movie, and they just don't, they just don't like it. Yeah. They just don't want it. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, years later, the, maybe even two years later, that kid will sit down and watch it in front of their TV and just be like, oh, this is kind of Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of it yeah. is a like if you're if you're going from the kids' perspective too, it's like yeah. you know, I think I think most kids today would still enjoy most Miyazaki movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, that does not necessarily directly translate for all kids' properties. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. I don't know if a kid show, even say like I mean, what's a good example of a kid show? There there are some timeless ones like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and all that sure. stuff. That yeah. you can still show right. kids, but they don't all. 
maybe like Johnny Quest is a good example. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't know if you could show a kid that today. Mm. And like the the comparison is like children are watching Demon Slayer. Right. Like, True. Yeah. And, and you know, so maybe maybe it's a, a shifting your perspective of like what yeah. are kids watching today? Good like point. children, yeah. middle schoolers and elementary schoolers were watching Attack on Titan. Yeah. And we're watching Demon Slayer. True. And like for fans that are a little bit older, we like are like, that is not something that I would think a kid would watch. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but it's Netflix is like, here's the new Demon Slayer, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, this kind of like dovetails into a discussion we've had before of like, mm. uh, I think Demon Slayer is at the level of like a Miyazaki film where it's like, true. Yeah. They're not watching an. Demon Slayer is not an anime to an anime fan. Demon mm. Slayer is a show that Netflix is showing you, mm -hmm. and you say, I'm a fan of Demon Slayer. Mm -hmm. Or, like, you know, uh, of this franchise in general. Whereas yeah. Miyazaki, you're like, oh, I'm a fan of Miyazaki, but I'm not a fan of anime. That's actually a really yeah. good point. I think part of the complexity here, uh, not to get this too much into, like, the history of it, is that we're talking about how Miyazaki got so big because he wasn't like anime. These days, that doesn't matter. Right. Like, you know, anyone under 20, for anyone under 20, anime is another animated medium out there. And yeah, there's some, you know, disgusting stuff out there. And yeah, there's some sexualized stuff, whatever. But, like, there's much less prejudice against anime now than there was in 1985, right? Or 1992. So I think um, you almost don't have to be non-anime to be popular anymore. That's, that is certainly true. The, one of the first blogs that I wrote when mm. I wrote to David Walker <laughs> um, back in the early 90s was um, um, Anime Behind the Big Eyes. Mm. And the whole point of that was discussing anime because people did, it was just like, oh, it's 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 the, the, the animation for Japan. The, the big eyes, right? The big <laughs> eyes. You know? So kind of just talking about it you know, mm. as, an, as a style of animation where yes there's big eyes but there's more yeah. to it than that blah 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 mm -hmm. but nowadays uh, to the points that's being made here is that those kinds of things are no longer needed because everyone is just like okay I've got CGI I've got gaming I've got mm -hmm. um, you know all this stuff and this is just one of many I love Venture Brothers but I also like Demon Slayer you know yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of those, those, those things where it's just no longer it's just like you know you can like like back in the day it used to be like oh yeah you can watch you know American animation be be cool yeah but then you say well I watch anime and suddenly you're just like oh. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it, it, some of it comes down to just like there is some invisible barrier that we don't understand that mm -hmm. has to be broken through for a someone to reach Miyazaki's level and which is like I if I was to like get people interested or get a generation interested in an anime you do mm. what Toonami did and you do what Netflix yeah, is doing yeah. now it's like you put it front and center and you're like okay at 4 o'clock or 4.30 for Toonami mm -hmm. that was when kids came home from school that was the first thing they saw when they came yeah. home from school that was why Dragon Ball Z reached the heights it did and why Pokemon reached the heights it did mm -hmm. and for and, those of us older it was Voltron right <laughs> and then uh, Netflix like because most kids don't watch TV nowadays. They watch streaming services and YouTube. Mm -hmm. Netflix is like, when you log on to Netflix and it knows the algorithm knows you, it's mm -hmm. like, here's Demon Slayer. Yeah, yeah. And it and kids are like, okay. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to get the generation interested, you start them basically start them young. You, yeah. You focus on the kids to build a you know a lifelong fan, but the problem is is that even something like Dragon Ball Z like. Pokemon is a unique case because it, it being the highest grossing media franchise of all time puts yeah. it in a league of its own. But something like Dragon Ball Z does not have the universal appeal of a Miyazaki movie. Sure. Even though Dragon Ball Z is arguably as well known as a Miyazaki movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I would also argue, though, that maybe we're not going to have another Miyazaki because we don't need one anymore. You know... Anime has become so much a part of the air we breathe, if you will, in that, you know, you go on Netflix, there's anime. You go anywhere you want, there's anime. Um, you know, there's, in my grocery store, there are, you know, in, in little candy stuff out, for, in right. little, you know, uh, 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 you know how Gachapon, right. uh, but yeah, the little, little like uh, gumball machines. Um, there's, you know, Pikachu and, and Goku on those. 
um, there's not going to be an anti anime pe- person because no one wants anti anime anymore. Um, you know, anime anime doesn't have that reputation anymore. It does, you don't need to make stuff that is, that appeals to the masses. Because anime already appeals to the masses. The kids are already watching Demon Slayer, so it could be that, 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 that there's just not going to be a a niche for a Miyazaki like <coughs> major creator anymore. It's just going to be here are folks who make more or less successful anime, right? <coughs> well, for me, the 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 one of the telltales that I knew that anime was starting to make into this conscious consciousness of globally. Um, was when you turn on Hulu and there's oh here's your anime section. So it's like wait, yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> Usually it's lumped into animation or mm-hmm. you know, something like that. But it, here's your anime. Yeah. Oh oh, and then it goes adult animation. Wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and there's a like section Barnes and Noble at like Tyson's Corner has a gigantic manga section. Yeah. And it's, there's usually four to five people there at any given right. time. Yeah. Um, and I mean. That's a slow ramp up process from like the early 2010s, early late 2000s, yeah. where like bar- book, books a million. Mm-hmm. No, Borders was having that kind oh, yeah. of similar oh, yeah. thing. Manga but, cows. Right, and uh, yeah, it's it's kind of just like can any director reach that kind of celebrity status too? Yeah, uh, like you, I don't think it's unique to uh, Demon Slayer or anything specifically, but like you couldn't. A kid could not tell you who directed Demon Slayer. Yeah, uh, that's true. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a kid wouldn't be able to tell you who directed the Miyazaki film either, but it is a lot easier to draw a parallel between uh, Spirited Away and Miyazaki mm. than it is to draw a parallel between the director of Demon Slayer and the author of Demon Slayer. Mm. It's like, well, who is more responsible for the kid's enjoyment of that? True. It is a team of people, uh, and yeah. unfortunately anime staff oftentimes falls by the wayside um and i mean to be totally fair there's a lot of people working on miyazaki's works too that often yeah. fall, fall by the wayside and in, in a lot of even like uh works where there's a director there's open questions as to how active the director is right. <laughs> so yeah it's like uh, the, there was some anime that they're talking about where the they asked the staff about the director and they they, they were like we didn't see him for months you know, it's like, okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, directors hold a lot of power. Yeah. Anno, Anno took 10 years to make yeah. 4.0. <laughs> yep. And there was a lot of uh, staff members being like, yeah, he told us to do whatever we wanted. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the director the director gets the laurels, basically. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, which is why we have staff credits. You know, so you, you can at least see who else was was involved. Um, so you could be that one guy who goes, I swear to God, I did some of the animation on Nausicaa. I swear, I swear. That guy is Anno. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty much that is that. Um, cool, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Do we have any other questions from the chat as we finish up this talk here? I think it's been an very interesting conversation and uh yeah it is it is amazing thinking about how much has changed since miyazaki's ascendancy that might make that might complicate the ability for anyone to even reach those heights anymore yeah um, it's a, this is definitely a topic we're hopefully going to do again and yeah. cons in the future with uh different perspectives because we'll hopefully have other mm. presenters as well yeah right uh, mm-hmm. you know the more the merrier i think uh, online is a good pl- way to do this mm-hmm. but in a real life format, real, mm. your voice is more likely to be heard, quote unquote, yeah. because you know you can just interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's finish it out with with um, a controversial question. Uh-oh. Um, what is everybody's least favorite Studio Ghibli film? Mm. I, I mean, I didn't really pay attention to Ponyo. Fair. Yep. Yeah. I mean, but I've got, I've even seen Ocean Waves. That's mine. <laughs> I I find it fascinating that Ghibli did essentially a standard rom- romantic yeah. drama mm-hmm. that yeah. is like it's like it was playing at the Alamo near me and I was like mm. <laughs> Ghibli yeah. why bother uh, it would have to have been Ponyo for me simply yeah. because I, I actually watched about 20 minutes in and I just said I can't <laughs> Yeah, and 
for anyone watching who's like, I love Ponyo. Ponyo's aimed at young children, and that's fine, right? And you can watch it for that. You can enjoy it for that. Totally fine. It is just not something that, like, grabbed my or our attention the way other Miyazaki films did. I'm just not the demographic. <laughs> I certainly don't watch Pop Poco. Oh, oh, yeah. That's an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting yeah. one. Uh, Pompoco can also be a uh, acquired taste. Yes. <laughs> and it's unusual to, to have such a list of, hey, it's that guy on the English. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. Clancy Brown is, is one of the voices. Yeah, they, they threw a bunch of yeah. kind of oh, folks onto that one. What I was one. impressed, speaking of Ghibli Works, mm. is that they continued the pedigree of having an insane cast for the dub, even yeah. though it was yeah. G. I think it was also G Kids that did. Mm. They like they had Robert Pattinson and William Defoe, yeah, and yeah. Christian yeah. Bale. Everyone, yeah, that's I was right. like, <laughs> how are they pulling these people? Yeah, and I, I know like when the, originally when, when it happened, like when the word went out on Mononoke, um, uh, who plays Moro? Um, um, oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, uh, X Files. Um, Julian Anderson. Oh, yeah. um, Julian Anderson was like, can I be in? Right, like, like yeah. she was a huge Miyazaki fan, so she like jumped at the opportunity. Said, "Give me, give me a single line in that movie, and I'll be happy." So, like early um, in it, there was a lot of just folks who were like, "Oh yes, I will, I will sign up." But by this point, I don't think it has that level. So yeah, G Kids is. I think that kind it of must arc. be like coasting on reputation. Yeah, it's true. Like, ba- Christian Bale was in Howl's Moving Castle, mm-hmm. um, and like Disney, but Disney had these the power to pull all these people in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess I guess G Kids was kind of just banking on like, oh we gotta we gotta go for Star Power. Well, and also in fairness, like G Kids knows they're going to make a certain amount of money on a, right. on, on that. So I think they they can also budget for higher uh, actors. Right. So yeah, I mean, uh, a, a different way of making it accessible. Yeah, Star exactly. Power. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that did not happen for Dragonlance. Mm, you know, no could boy. Not, could not save that dumpster fire. Yeah, no. Um, oh, apparently, uh, Bale was a F- Ghibli fan and asked for just anything, and they ended up giving the lead. Nice. Cool. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, Mark Hamill, he was yeah. in uh, right. He was in Castle and Nausicaa, actually. Yeah, right. Um, which is really cool. Um, but, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you all for the conversation. Thank you all in chat for the chat.